Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear a report from Anna Mateo and Dorothy Gundy. Later, Jill Robbins answers a question from an English learner. We close with an American story. This week, it is Benito Sereno, Part 1. But first, here are Anna and Dorothy. In the United States, small train displays are one of the most popular attractions during the holiday season. They used to be common in toy store windows. Now they are seen in many public places, such as at plant shows, exhibits, and museums. One kind of display, however, is special. In these displays, the model structures are made from leaves sticks, and other dried plant materials. This creates a different kind of magic and whimsy. It's magical because people love to picture themselves in these small landscapes, Karen Dobman told the Associated Press. She oversees exhibitions and public events at the New York Botanical Garden in New York City. Dopman added that the displays of greenery hide whimsical elements surrounding the models of trains and decorated structures. New York Botanical Garden first used this kind of train display back in 1992. But this unique style did not begin in New York City. It began in the Midwestern state of Ohio. Almost 40 years ago, Ohio landscape architect Paul Bussey found a way to share his love of trains, architecture, and gardens with the public. He set up a garden railway exhibit at the 1982 Ohio State Fair. He decorated the buildings with dried plant material. He called it his botanical architecture. Throughout the 1980s, Bussey developed his whimsical structures. In 1991, he launched his own company, he ran Applied Imagination out of his basement in Cincinnati, Ohio. His botanical architecture train displays appeared at garden shows, mainly in the Midwest. Then, in 1992, the New York Botanical Garden invited Bussey and his team to create a holiday train show. The organization wanted winter visitors to enjoy what was already popular in many Midwestern towns and cities. That first year, it only featured a couple train tracks and a handful of models of New York landmarks, said Dobman. But she said it was such a success that it became a yearly tradition. Each year they would add new landmarks, such as a famous building or place in New York City. The idea soon spread, and more places wanted to copy their landmarks in botanical architecture. Bussey soon ran out of space in his basement, he moved his company to Alexandria, Kentucky, where it is now based. The company has about 12 full-time employees. 
Bussy's daughter, Laura Bussy Dolan, now runs the business. Dolan described the materials her group uses to the Associated Press. She said they use different kinds of sticks, pine cones, and other plant pieces. Over the years, the company has learned not to use some kinds of fruits and nuts. We now avoid using dried berries or acorns in our structures because they are far too edible, Dolan said. They had a problem with little creatures eating the structures while they were stored. One year, the squirrels ate one of our lamp posts. The shows are now a tradition in many U.S. cities. They show a combination of model trains and detailed models of famous buildings and landmarks. Last year, many holiday season train shows were canceled or limited to fewer visitors because of the coronavirus pandemic. But this year, the popular offerings are back at gardens and other places around the country. Dolan's teams are putting together nine holiday shows this year. To create all the shows, Dolan said the teams at Applied Imagination leave home in October and travel until Thanksgiving. It takes every individual in the company to finish the displays. Dolan said that every year the company creates about 50 structures for different places. She estimates the company has made between 2,000 to 3,000 total structures since it started. The smaller ones take around 250 hours, she said. However, one of their largest is a copy of the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, more than three meters in size. That structure took nearly 3,000 hours to complete. It is on display at the Biltmore Estate through the holidays this year, Dolan said. On the website for Applied Imagination, Paul Bussey credits his mother for his work. Jane Bussey, the website says, was a gifted artist. Her work has been celebrated at the Smithsonian and the Cincinnati Art Museum. The website goes on to explain that Jane liked a famous, costly home in the area called Carson Mansion. She liked it so much that the year her son Paul was born, 1949, she made a small version using very strong paper and matchsticks. To honor his mother, Paul made his own version of the Carson Mansion using his own botanical architectural design. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. Hello. Today on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question about punctuation marks from Luai in Syria. I hope you can tell me about the difference between punctuation marks, such as the semicolon, the colon, and the comma and between round brackets and square brackets. Luai, Syria Dear Luai, thank you for writing with this very interesting question. Even native speakers have trouble with these punctuation marks when writing English. Let us begin with the simplest one, the comma. First, you need to understand the sentence. It is a group of words with a subject and a verb that expresses a complete thought. Another name we give to sentences is independent clause. That means the group of words forms a sentence by itself. 
As you can guess, there is another kind of word group that cannot stand alone. We call that a dependent clause. The most common use of a comma is to separate an independent clause and a dependent clause. When we read the examples in this lesson, we will say the punctuation marks out loud so listeners can understand where they belong. Every Thursday, comma, VOA has a new everyday grammar lesson. The independent clause is VOA has a new everyday grammar lesson. The dependent clause, every Thursday, comma, is separated by a comma. There are many other uses for commas, which you can read about in our everyday grammar lesson. The colon is two dots, one over the other. It has three main uses. One is to introduce a list of things. The part of the sentence before the colon should be an independent clause. Here's an example. Ashton likes only three kinds of fruit, colon, apples, bananas, and cherries. You should not use a colon when the list is part of the independent clause, as in, Ashton likes apples, bananas, and cherries. Note that these things are separated by commas, but there is no comma before and. That is a debated subject we will not get into today. You can also use a colon between two independent clauses when the second one explains the first. We ate all of the ice cream, colon. It was too hot this afternoon. Third, you can use a colon to emphasize a phrase or word at the end of a sentence. After hours of work, we saw what we wanted, colon, a clean house. Moving on to the semicolon, you may say it looks like a period or a dot above a comma. We use a semicolon to connect two independent clauses that have related subjects. For example, I think we should study in the bookstore, semicolon. My friend works there. You should never use a comma to connect two independent clauses. Note that the semicolon takes the place of any conjunction that might connect two independent clauses. A good test of whether you have used the semicolon correctly is to replace it with a conjunction, that is, or, for, and, or but. Here is a sentence with a semicolon between the two independent clauses. The cat came in the door, semicolon. It was carrying a mouse. When we replace the semicolon with and, we no longer need to use the semicolon. The cat came in the door, and it was carrying a mouse. Your last question was about the marks you call round and square brackets. The round ones are called parentheses. We use them to add some information to help explain what we have written. When reading them aloud, we say open parentheses for the one on the left side and close parentheses for the opposite one on the right. For example, I opened a can of food for Makeda, open parentheses, the dog, close parentheses, and put it in a dish. The square brackets have several uses. They are used to put comments or information into direct quotations, to identify errors in text, and to add more information within something that is already in parentheses. Here are examples of the brackets in action. His mother said, Look, this letter, open bracket, 
It was from the university, close bracket, came for you. Alex picked up the bag, open parenthesis. He thought it held more water, open bracket. It only had empty bottles, close bracket, close parenthesis, and shook it. You may also see brackets around a Latin word, open bracket, sick, close bracket, showing there was a mistaken word in what someone else wrote. I hope this answers your question, Luai. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Jill Robin. Our story today is called Benito Sereno. It was written by Herman Melville. We will tell this story in three parts. Here is Shep O'Neill with part one of Benito Sereno. Captain Benito Sereno hurried aboard his ship. It was ready to sail. A bright sun and a soft breeze promised good weather ahead. The ship's anchor was raised, and the San Dominique, old but still seaworthy, moved slowly out of the harbor of Valparaiso on the west coast of Chile. It was carrying valuable products and slaves up the Pacific coast to Callao, another Spanish colonial port near Lima, Peru. The slaves, both male and female, slept on deck. They were not chained because their owner... Don Alejandro said they were peaceful. The San Dominique moved steadily forward under a clear sky. The weather showed no sign of change. Day after day, the soft breeze kept the ship on course toward Peru. Slave traffic between Spain's colonial ports in this year of 1799 had been steady, but there were few outbreaks of violence. What happened, therefore, on board the San Dominique could not have been expected. On the seventh day out, before daybreak, the slaves rose up in rebellion they swept through the ship with handspikes and hatchets, moving with the fury of desperate men. The attack was a complete surprise. Few of the crew were awake. All hands, except the two officers on the watch, lay in a deep, untroubled sleep. The rebels sprang upon the two officers and left them half dead. Then, one by one, they killed eighteen of the sleeping crew. They threw some overboard, alive. A few hid and escaped death. The rebels tied up seven others, but left them alive to navigate the ship. As the day began to break... Captain Sereno came slowly, carefully, up the steps toward the chief rebel leader, Babo, and begged for mercy. He promised to follow Babo's commands if he would only put an end to the killings. But this had no effect. Babo had three men brought up on deck and tied. Then the three Spaniards were thrown overboard. Babo did this to show his power and authority that he was in command. Babo, however, promised not to kill Captain Sereno. But everything he said carried a threat. 
He asked the captain if in these seas there were any Negro countries. None, Sereno answered. Then take us to Senegal or the neighboring island of St. Nicholas. Captain Sereno was shaken. That is impossible, he said. It would mean going around Cape Horn, and this ship is in no condition for such a voyage, and we do not have enough supplies or sails or water. Take us there anyway, Babo answered sharply, showing little interest in such details. If you refuse, we will kill every white man on board. Captain Sereno knew he had no choice. He told the rebel leader that the most serious problem in making such a long voyage was water. Babo said they should sail to the island of Santa Maria, near the southern end of Chile. He knew that no one lived on the island, but water and supplies could be found there. He forced Captain Sereno to keep away from any port. He threatened to kill him the moment he saw him start to move toward any city, town, or settlement on shore. Sereno had to agree to sail to the island of Santa Maria. He still hoped that he might meet along the way, or at the island itself, a ship that could help him. Perhaps, who knows, he might find a boat on the island and be able to escape to the nearby coast of Arruco. Hope was all he had left, and that was getting smaller each day. Captain Sereno steered south for Santa Maria. The voyage would take weeks. Eight days after the ship turned south, Babo told Captain Sereno that he was going to kill Don Alejandro, owner of the slaves on board. He said it had to be done. Otherwise, he and the other slaves could never be sure of their freedom. He refused to listen to the captain's appeals and ordered two men to pull Don Alejandro up from below and kill him on deck. It was done as ordered. Three other Spaniards were brought up and thrown overboard. Babo warned Sereno and the other Spaniards that each one of them would go the same way if any of them gave the smallest cause for suspicion. Sereno decided to do everything possible to save the lives of those remaining. He agreed to carry the rebels safely to Senegal if they promised peace and no further bloodshed. And he signed a document that gave the rebels ownership of the ship and its cargo. Later... As they sailed down the long coast of Chile, the wind suddenly dropped. The ship drifted into a deep calm. For days it lay still in the water. The heat was fierce. The suffering intense. There was little water that made matters worse. Some of those on board were driven mad. A few died. The pressure and tension made many violent, and they killed a Spanish officer. After a time, a breeze came up and set the ship free again, and it continued south. The voyage seemed endless. The ship sailed for weeks with little water on board. It moved through days of good weather and periods of bad weather. There were times when it sailed under heavy skies 
and times when the wind dropped and the ship lay becalmed in lifeless air. The crew seemed half dead. At last, one evening in the month of August, the San Dominique reached the lonely island of Santa Maria. It moved slowly toward one of the island's bays to drop anchor. Not far off lay an American ship, and the sight of the ship caught the rebels by surprise. The slaves became tense and fearful. They wanted to sail away quickly, but their leader, Babo, opposed such a move. Where could they go? Their water and food were low. He succeeded in bringing them under control and in quieting their fears. He told them they had nothing to fear, and they believed him. Then he ordered everyone to go to work, to clean the decks and put the ship in proper and good condition so that no visitor would suspect anything was wrong. Later, he spoke to Captain Sereno, warning him that he would kill him if he did not do as he was told. He explained in detail what Sereno was to do and say if any stranger came on board. He held a dagger in his hand, saying it would always be ready for any emergency. The American vessel was a large trade ship and seal hunter, commanded by Captain Amasa Delano. He had stopped at Santa Maria for water. On the American ship, shortly after sunrise, an officer woke Captain Delano and told him a strange sail was coming into the bay. The captain quickly got up, dressed, and went up on deck. Captain Delano raised his spyglass and looked closely at the strange ship coming slowly in. He was surprised that there was no flag. A ship usually showed its flag when entering a harbor where another ship lay at anchor. As the ship got closer, Captain Delano saw it was damaged. Many of its sails were ripped and torn. A mast was broken, and the deck was in disorder. Clearly, the ship was in trouble. The American captain decided to go to the strange vessel and offer help. He ordered his whaleboat put into the water and had his men bring up some supplies and put them in the boat. Then they set out toward the mystery ship. As they approached, Captain Delano was shocked at the poor condition of the ship. He wondered what could have happened, and what he would find. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 